Hello and greetings. My name is Mike McKinnon. I'm the SAS Innovation Director, director for uh, EBSCO Information Services. I was one of the first people to uh, introduce Shanghai Library to Folio and uh, the Folio community. So I'm honored to be uh, included in today's schedule. Thank you for that very much. Um, today, you're going to be hearing a lot about Folio from a lot of different presenters. And instead of me doing even more on Folio, what I figured that would be beneficial for the community would be to talk briefly about uh, the evolving open source services, uh, the software as a service services anyway from EBSCO, um, and, and our point of view on where open source really fits within the library. So before I do that, before I jump into that uh, material that I've, I've prepared today, I'd like to thank the members of the Folio Technical and Application Committee of Shanghai Library's Industrial Association. I'd like to thank members of the Shanghai Library Industry and Information Development Community. I'd like to thank the Callis Folio Community, and of course, the various public libraries in attendance and from across the world joining us today. Thank you for that. So, as we're looking at open source, since we really want to talk about open source as it evolves for software services for libraries, um, I wanted to talk first just very briefly about the EBSCO company mission. And you're seeing it here uh, to transform lives by providing relevant and reliable information when, where, and how people need it. And I think that the mission statement is really fundamental to the values of libraries across the world. So we continue to strive towards this mission every day with all of the services that we make and the services from which we partner with as well. The company mission is not just specific to enabling EBSCO content and EBSCO services though. Really the big part of uh, providing relevant and reliable information is doing so without barriers and doing it in open source toolkits. So without barriers as a, as a phrase is really software oftening or often meaning uh, working with other open source initiatives, whether that's EBSCO or whether that's outside of EBSCO, like Folio, for instance. So uh, that's what I want to focus on today. And in fact, if you look at open source outside of the library industry, if we take even a bigger step back, open source really is across lots of different verticals and functional landscapes. In fact, in the last, say, 15 years, the corporate development of open source today far outweighs the older concepts of open source that was primarily driven by hobbyists or by loan developers, individuals who had an idea and an initiative, and then they went and created an individual product or project. That still happens, of course. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing major corporations investing in open source or even maybe investing in some functional area and then giving it to open source after the fact. So open source software consists of tools today like Docker. We're all familiar with Docker for containers, uh, particularly if we look at hosted services worldwide, whether that's AWS or if that's Azure or GCP um, or Ali Cloud, right? They're the open, uh, hosted services often deploy container integrations just for using hosted environments. Um, there you have FileZilla for file storage and development platforms like, like Blender for uh, open source animation. Um, you could use even the behemoths like your uh, Facebooks and uh, uh, Adobe, uh, or even uh, Huawei has uh, Linux integrations. So these, these major initiatives towards open source are not just in the library landscape. They are worldwide software initiatives that are enabling both bespoke integrations as well as enabling uh, uh, um, more customized developments that help us fulfill needs that the original tool never uh, could do by itself. So, Open source by its very nature has some real inherent values and it becomes really a direct product strength to be open source. And that you have things like transparency for roadmaps and both good and bad functional areas, but the transparency around how the product was developed and what's coming next. Open source provides uh, interoperability just really because it needs to in almost all cases where the open source has 
fulfilled a need, but it knows it's part of a larger ecosystem. Versus contrary to that, you would have individual vendor tools that are often these walled gardens and interoperability isn't a requisite. Open source also provides a lot of access, things for access about the underlying data or access to development groups or communities for talking about how they're deploying those open source tools. Things that a lot of, again, those, those walled garden software kits don't necessarily provide. And then lastly, you want here, partnerships. And I think this is really where Folio, as far as a community has come together, where we have Folio partnerships worldwide. Currently, there are more than 20 worldwide partners for supporting, implementing, hosting, training, and, and uh, um, uh, really doing custom bespoke uh, development in Folio. And that's fantastic news, right? This is about taking a small initiative that we thought would be really beneficial, and now it's really been adopted worldwide. And Shanghai Library's adoption of it and really its drive of Folio inside of China and its contributions to the world are well noted. So we're, we're really excited to have Shanghai Library be part of the Folio group. Um, and I'm really personally proud to, to have been uh, uh, part of that in the early stages too. So if we think about open source as, hey, it's acceptable, it's viable, it's used worldwide across all software landscapes. It's not just something small anymore. And it's not just for libraries. Well, what considerations for libraries should we be thinking about? If it is this open, acceptable platform, or, or, or sorry, not platform, open, acceptable development strategy and deliverable strategy, what is it that libraries should be looking at when you're looking at open source systems across the landscape of tools that libraries have a requisite to perform for their patrons? Well, you've got creation about uh, making sure that we're delivering on uh, how actual um, uh, research is created, articles are published, um, scholarly um, outcomes can be uh, reproduced. So the creation of content, you've got open source uh, potentials within the consumption of that content, whether this is searching across content, reading the content or accessing it and then integrating that content. And then of course, what librarians all need is we need to be able to manage that content. So, so these are really the functional areas within a library. And I wanna focus on open source uh, um, uh, engagements that EBSCO is pushing um, as we look at partnerships that we have and areas where our efforts have been spent of late in these three areas. So let's start with creation. First, when we look at creation, publication creation is just this natural starting point for open source, right? The global landscape of research institutions have geographic and funding requisites that are often regional. Either you have a local government funder or you have a local corporate funder funding a research project, and the research project has specific needs. And those needs may not be uh, needs that are you know, uh, required in Japan as they are required in, uh, say, London. So you have these global implications to research creation and output. But you also have a variety of authors and data points and methodologies about creating that research project and then the, the output, the final output, that article. So there is a vast amount of open source tools already designed for this, for the creation of uh, a scholarly output, for the creation of non-scholarly output. If I wanted to create a, a fiction novel, I could go pull up Amazon and publish a personal novel on an Amazon ebook platform. Right, it's completely free and open. Alibaba has the same if I wanted to do the same on their platform. So there are several uh, platforms out there that are open source and freely available to uh, researchers and creators everywhere. So what should we as libraries be looking at when we're looking at those tools? Well, I think first we should back up and say, well, what are the areas within scholarly research that are different than areas in open publishing tools like an Amazon ebook platform, for example. Well, in a scholarly area, we have a, a requirement really to make sure that there is reproducibility of the scholarly outcomes. The data points in order to be able to go through a peer review process are not just about making sure that there was some provenance around where the research originated from, but making sure that there's 
uh, reproducibility and reusability in the research that was done, making sure that that research often had collaboration between one institution and another institution, both to raise the visibility, but to raise the scholarly IQ uh, level, uh, the, the acuity of it, um, and to make sure that the compliance on the research itself fulfilled the needs of the underlying funder. So we have these levels of rigor around scholarly output that we need to make sure that whatever open source tool we leverage performs those functional areas. Otherwise, it's just as uh, superficial, if you will, as something that doesn't have any scholarly requirements. So looking at this uh, pump, uh, this, this requisite, these, these uh, requirements that we need at a platform level, how many open source tools are there that you can think of that fill these needs? The answer is not many, right? If you look at the open source tools out there for publishing, you have things like uh, shared collaboration platforms, something similar to say uh, Office 365 or a Google Docs. Um, but you also have like a GitHub for a reproduction, reproduction of code or even potential data sharing, but nothing that combines everything together and nothing that helps me actually reproduce say research articles that may be 10, 15, 20 years old where that data may have simply fallen away. So what we, we have looked at at an, at an outcome level is we've seen this. And this here, we have an underlying code embedded in here, sorry, uh, underlying data points embedded into this article. But how do we actually make use of that data? The data is there, but it's a superficial data point. It's about we used this sample, this sample had these values. But beyond that, it's really hard to be able to take that data and run it through the process again to make sure that we're getting both uh, uh, reproducible, consistent outcomes so that we know that the research that was done was done in a provable way, that this is a vi viable scholarly article that is some supporting narrative around an initiative that was fruitful. Right, that's generally what we're looking for with scholarly research. So how do we publish this in a way that does provide us the data in a reusable fashion? Well, we want to make sure that we have not just funding requisites for standards and compliance data, but we have the ability to take the existing code, methods, and data points and use APIs for each of those platforms, or even use uh, embedded run environments that we don't have to go back and get old uh, code base support within our IT departments or um, learn, say, new languages from scratch. Maybe I have to go learn VB. If I, if I know JSON, but I don't know VB, maybe it's harder for me to go ahead and redo that work. Or maybe I have to hire out for it, and that's a whole other barrier around funding, right? to be able to reproduce some code process work in order to fulfill my article needs. And then, of course, we want to make sure that there are consistent attributes within all of our research so that those attributes can be integrated into other systems and shared out on research platforms so that then they can be correlated to, say, uh, um, not just the DOI in the article, but they can be correlated to data sets themselves. So, this, these parameters are really requisite with an open source platform in the research area. Now, to that end, EBSCO has partnered with two managed open source platforms to enable better scholarly publishing and academic rigor. This protocols.io and CodeOcean. Now, we're helping enable more transparency and interoperability. We're helping enable access and partnerships all of those four key attributes around open source right with these two platforms. Remember, it's a core value to libraries across the world. So protocols.io, it helps us collaborate and research methods, uh, collaborate on research methods across different groups at different institutions globally and reproduce that same research successfully because we have a step-by-step -step process to follow. CodeOcean lets us not only store the code used uh, uh, to, to say derive that data that they ultimately had out of that article, but also the run environments necessary to run 
that process that gave us the data. So I don't have to go outsource development work or I don't have to be able to know specific scripting and have platforms to support it on my own. That deprecation of framework of old code bases simply isn't there. It's all built into the platform. These are both managed open source services. These are services that are widely used, right? You have researchers from uh, not only Oceana, but you have researchers from the US and Europe and even researchers from China. So we want to be able to support these within EBSCO platforms and support the platforms themselves as they grow within the world of open source. And not to be left outside of those two with protocols and code ocean, but that's also Archivum. Now Archivum is built on open source Archivematica for long-term digital preservation. It is a managed open source service. So if you don't want to manage an archive on your own, but you want to follow open source fundamentals and the framework for standards, all of the things that we described earlier as paramount functionality for open source, well, Archivum's a fantastic system to work with. On top of that, Archivum has actually already done integration work with Folio. So now you can not only manage your bibliographic records in Folio, but you could manage your EAD or your ISAT-G schema archive records within Folio as well on an Archivum app. So this idea about bringing these requisites together in open source for creation of work is completely viable today. It's more now about making sure everybody knows that these platforms exist and that their research work should go and be leveraged on those platforms as they start collaborating with other institutions worldwide. And what we're seeing downstream as an outcome are articles like this. So this is in PLOS One, right? This is an open source publishing platform for science. And as I scroll down here to the bottom, I can actually see there's an embedded code ocean link. So I could go see the run environment and rerun the code used to derive the data. There's a protocols link so that I could actually see the step-by-step -step process used to create this research. This research reproducibility and academic rigor in open source is fantastic to see. It is the next evolution of publishing and creation. Um, and the fact that we can now tie that to everything else that we're gonna be uh, doing within say folio ecosystems or others Really, it's just, it's great to see. So if creation itself is supported and we have platforms that, that can fully fulfill the needs from a research environment on creation, how about consumption? Right? As users have evolving expectations on consumption, whether they're on their mobile phone, or maybe they're not on the mobile phone and they are on a, on a either laptop or PC desktop, and they're, they're trying to navigate a research task how are we meeting their newer expectations versus research tasks of old? Well, looking at the landscape, of course, everybody has changing user expectations based on the open web environment we get access to. If I'm getting access to items on Baidu Scholar, that's going to affect how I want to be consuming content on my own uh, publisher platforms while I'm reading something on say uh, uh, an Elsevier platform, or I'm reading something on an IEEE or on an EBSCO platform, I'm gonna be looking for a new modern experience like I would get from the open web. Now we need to make sure that we're also meeting accessibility needs, we need to make sure we're meeting single sign-on, some seamless authentication needs. As I move from say the open web inside my institution of research I want to make sure that that process doesn't create more barriers for me. And that the integration that we have between the, the research creation and the consumption are also seamless. So that as I'm moving across this authentication landscape, not only do those articles get uh, discoverable, uh, discoverable within my, uh, my front end system, but they also get um, easy pass through and accessible to, uh, to patrons as they go from say searching to access. I also want to make sure that they can do it on any device. Users should be able to come in on mobile, save an article or even save a search, and then go to their last laptop or desktop and be able to see that previous search that was there or see those items that they've saved. This open ecosystem we need to make sure we meet and EBSCO is 
doing just that. Yes, the EBSCO Discovery Service is not open source, but we are integrating with open source platforms, both for content and for, say, learning management systems, for uh, a open APIs to, say, customized front ends, to open source backends for management. The fact that EDS is evolving to meet users' expectations and evolving for open source integrations is something that's really important for users today. Now we're going a little bit further than just modernizing the front user interface of the EBSCO Discovery Service. We're also creating uh, information literacy tools to help users both explore why there's relationships between uh, uh, content that they're looking at, but how do they actually distill relationships into something that is very valuable to their query? So here we have our concept search. Now, I don't want to make sure that concept search isn't some third party, some, some outside tool for them to use. I want patrons to be able to come in and do their, their searches that they need. But then if they want to look further within the same environment, I want them to easily get access to a tool like a concept search to help them distill down even further around the collections it is that they're trying to find the most relevant articles and items. Now, of course, there's also, as I mentioned, open APIs. So yes, EDS has APIs, and what you're seeing here is a folio site. This is the National Library of Florence, Italy, and they are live on OC Genius, which is a open source UX. It's like a viewfind or a blacklight. Um, this is an open source UX that they have an EDS um, uh, API connected to it and a folio backend to it as well. OC Genius provides OPAC functionality. So if they want not only your patron features of integration, but they want, uh, say, not just known item searching, but they want to look for call numbers, well, OC Genius provides that type of, of service. So is this gives uh, National Library of Florence best of both worlds, discovery services, open source backend for management, and an open source front end for uh, patron integration. So creation of content is fully supported in open source today and consumption of content. And of course, we have to get to the management of this in an open source environment. And of course, Folio is the answer, right? This is a Folio. Uh, session. So I, I want to make sure that we all understand why we got here. Now, Folio is a great modern new platform, but when you look at the services that are surround Folio, how we got here is really because of the microservices architecture of modern enterprise tools. So microservices allow everything you're seeing on the right, which is basically your community engagement, where you can have applications or even just bespoke functionality that doesn't have a say a front end app but it has back end business logic you can have applications deployed from any contributor to the environment so for instance you have ILL on the right that was originally developed by Lehigh University they did instant functionality in folio and i think even Shanghai library is continuing to work on that today and on the left you have EBSCO also integrating the services that are within our environment into Folio as open source. So you don't have to go onto an EBSCO version of Folio to make use of the services on the left. We are integrating our services directly with the open source Folio community. So this type of ecosystem, this microservices architecture is different from historical open source platforms. Right? You have your Kohas and your Koalio Lays that have been open source in the past, and there are others too. Um, but what separates them from Folio as the next platform of choice really is not only the community, and I, I'm grateful for everybody here for continuing to work in the community. The more you develop and share, the more I benefit. The more I develop and share, the more you benefit. Right? This Together we can create great systems um, and great functional areas, that's what we really want to empower here. But the microservices of Folio really make sure that at a functional level, it, it works. To that end, EBSCO is also building its first 
non-core functionality, really, of Folio, a first third-party EBSCO app. I don't know if you'd really call it that, but uh, really it's, it's non-requisite functional area of Folio in EBSCO analytics. So EBSCO has uh, um, uh, really, at this point, its beta environment has created a beta tool for a fully robust visual BI tool for uh, some business intelligence uh, insights around print and e, uh, e-resources and print resources, both the circulation and, and counter statistics of usage of your collections, but then integrating other data points as well, data points like authentication data, data points like your facilities data, um, anything that you have that has an API, we'd like to be able to integrate and then create some dashboards that make sense uh, to you and your library. Um, and this is, you know, again, not a core requisite of Folio. Folio has an analytics platform that's getting uh, some development uh, in the LDP, which is the library data platform. And so this is another tool and we continue to expect more tools like this will be built where we will have a robust infrastructure of support and choice around what functions and tools do we want in our own instances of Folio. So as I close out this discussion, I really want to make sure that we all see EBSCO continues to support open source. We continue to drive integrations of our own tools in open source tools that libraries find value in all across the ecosystem, whether that's creation of content, whether that's consumption of content or the management of content. And not only are we supporting them directly with funding in many cases, but in development as well and uh, integration of our own tools. So uh, we really think that there's a really bright future for open source for libraries. And I'm excited to see where Shanghai Library is gonna continue to take Folio and Folio uh, uh, tangential tools. So to me, it's a fantastic project. So that's all I've got. Thanks again. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, if you have any questions, please, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much.